Hi, I'm John Farrell. One of the authors of Choosing Electric Avenue, ILSR's new report on electric vehicles. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. I wanted to start with a short video. And it was a little tricky to figure out how the audio works, so I apologize if it's not going to be perfect. You can look this video up online if you like. Um, but this, uh, I think, describes, in my mind, one of the most important reasons we should be thinking about electric vehicles and why people are excited about them. So here we go. Oh, is this we're going to do the same thing? Like <laughs> There's 60. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a roller coaster. Oh, my God. All righty. Basically, I didn't have any really important reason for showing that other than I thought it was pretty good. Uh, but to me, uh, it, there will be none of the uh, – you won't have to worry about bleeping my voice during this presentation. Uh, but I do want to be able to convey some of the excitement that was in that video about electric vehicles and uh, talk a little bit about, first of all, why we need to act now in order to get the policy right to integrate them appropriately to our electricity system. Uh, a quick uh, little visit on the costs of inaction uh, and then con uh, two simple ways that we can act now uh, to capture a lot of the benefits of electric vehicles and then a little discussion of what the benefits of action are. So let's just jump into that. We'll start with the six reasons that we need to act now. Uh, to take advantage of uh, the growth of electric vehicles. And the first one, of course, is that there is growth. Uh, this is a chart uh, from Inside EVs and Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, shows the sales of electric vehicles in the United States. And through 2016, every single quarter had higher sales than any preceding quarter over the previous five years. So we're starting to see some real uptick and real surge in growth of electric vehicles uh, in terms of sales. I just pulled the numbers this morning from uh, the first quarter of 2017, and that trend is continuing, in fact, uh, very very strongly. So we're seeing some very uh, impressive growth uh, in the market. Now it's small to start. You can see on this chart here where we look at the forecasts for electric vehicle sales from a number of different um, initiatives, uh, including Bloomberg and Navigant and others. Uh, and you can see that um, you know where we are now, the red there uh, for 2016, um, is really just the start of these curves uh, forecasts uh, over time, but that the, the growth curves are um, expected to be quite significant uh, by most of the prognosticators. Uh, the Energy Information Administration is low, but if you uh, Google or look on Twitter for EIA forecasts, you will find a lot of folks who say to take them with a grain of salt when it comes to predicting uh, technology change. Uh, they've generally been lower, for example, on renewables for many, many years. Um, so uh, at any rate, we're going to see significant growth in electric vehicles. So that's the first reason, of course, that we need to act now is that uh, the sales curve is starting to curve up. We're going to see more adoption of electric cars, and we need to be able to uh, integrate them effectively. Uh, the second one is that we're going to see motivation for electric vehicle adoption among people uh, because they can save a lot of money uh, operating those vehicles. So this is a comparison of a 2017 Nissan Leaf versus a Nissan Versa, which is a relatively similarly sized car from the same company. Um, and, and there are a number of savings. Uh, over a 10-year period, you have uh, savings in scheduled maintenance, uh, savings in fuel costs compared to buying gasoline. Uh, and we've even netted out um, the battery replacement costs, which we forecast at about $3,000 at the end of those 10 years. We don't really know uh, what that could be like and whether or not that will be common to replace batteries at that time frame. Um, but it's worth noting that uh, the electric vehicle has many things uh, in addition uh, that uh, – uh, many potential savings in addition to this uh, because it does not include an analysis of typical repairs that are unique to gasoline cars, which include things like timing belts or water pumps, which if you've ever had a car – get to 90 or 100,000 miles, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so that's the second thing. Big savings are going to motivate people. Uh, for the third one here, we're going to go to the polls. So if, please look at the poll tab on your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. This will be your chance to weigh in. Uh, and we're going to look at this question of customer satisfaction as one of the potential motivations for why electric vehicle adoption is going to happen here. And you're going to have a ch chance to pick between five different vehicles uh, in terms of their customer satisfaction ratings. So I'm going to grab the poll here and go ahead and launch it. You should now be able to uh, vote which of these vehicles pictured here has the highest customer satisfaction rating. Uh, thanks so much for those of you already jumping in. Uh, and of course, uh, this is no, uh, I picked cars that were all white in order that there be no bias based on color. Uh, so you can have any color you like as long as it's white. Uh, we'll give folks just another few seconds here to vote uh, 
until it's been open for about 30 seconds, and then we'll go ahead and move on. But thanks again for participating uh, in the poll. So I'm going to go ahead and close it here. We've got about a little over two-thirds people turning out. That's good, especially for a midterm election or a special election, you might call it. And it looks like about three-fourths of folks uh, chose the Tesla Model S, uh, and that's correct. That has the highest customer satisfaction satisfaction rating according to Consumer Reports by a long shot, uh, by almost 15 points over any comparable vehicle. Uh, but the reason I wanted to, to highlight um, the Tesla in particular and electric vehicles in particular is that you find that hybrids and electric cars have customer satisfaction ratings that are very similar to large luxury cars. Now the Tesla kind of fits into both of these. It's an all electric car, but it's obviously a premium vehicle. On the other hand, a lot of the other cars that you're going to see on the top there, whether it's the Honda Accord Hybrid or the Toyota Prius, are not considered premium cars, but are simply cars that use uh, you know, an electric or partially electric drivetrain. And you're seeing very high customer satisfaction ratings. So that's the third reason I see for being optimistic about the growth of electric cars, is that people like them a lot. People are satisfied with them. They're not only likely to buy them the first time, they're likely to purchase them again. Um, so sales are rising, savings are there, customer satisfaction is high. And the fourth thing to think about is that Electric vehicles, even the ones that we have now that don't seem like they have a lot of range relative to a gasoline vehicle, are actually sufficient for most of what people use cars for. The 107-mile range on today's Nissan LEAF is enough for 83% of daily automobile use, which includes you know, the average daily commute plus running a few errands. I can testify this to somebody who's now owned one for about a month as a second vehicle, that it has certainly been more than sufficient for almost all of the needs of our household. Uh, and so especially when you're talking about households that have more than one car, uh, the Nissan LEAF or, or other electric vehicles available today do have a sufficient range, especially for those daily commutes for most Americans. And so I think there's a really big uh, market opportunity there as people start to get familiar with electric cars. Um, and of course, the fifth thing, uh, not only are, are they, uh, do they have good range now, but uh, you know, according to this uh, you know, map of new models coming out, uh, put out by Bloomberg, we have a lot more models coming out in the kind of affordable uh, category of vehicles whether it's the Tesla Model 3 or the Chevrolet Bolt, which has been released already this year, or next year's Nissan Leaf, uh, that are likely to offer uh, at least twice the range of uh, sort of the first generation uh, of these modern electric vehicles. Um, the last thing is that I remade that chart, uh, and I think this is perhaps the most important thing to think about in terms of why we need to act now. I remade that chart looking at these forecasts of electric vehicle sales and picked the one from Bloomberg. Uh, the 2030 marker there that I've labeled was uh, equivalent to $5 million, in, or sorry, 5 million vehicles annual sales in 2030. And I think what's important is I, I translated this into what that, those battery capacities would be in megawatts for 30,000, uh, uh, for, for 5 million electric vehicles. And it's about 30,000 megawatts, 30 gigawatts of capacity uh, if attached to a level two charger. And the reason that this is important is that, so we're, we're talking about 30 gigawatts, basically 30 utility scale power plants worth of energy demand being added to the grid every year after 2030. And that's within the time frame that a typical electric utility uh, is doing their 15-year resource planning. And so when we talk about why we need to start thinking about this now, when, when Excel Energy in Minnesota or Duke Energy in the Carolinas is putting together its 15-year uh, resource plan and is in front of regulators talking about what system demand is going to look like and, and how they need to plan for new power plants or infrastructure on the utility system, they need to be thinking about electric vehicles because they're going to be playing a role in their system whether they like it or not. So let's, um, now that we have kind of covered this range of reasons why it's important to act now and why the growth of electric vehicles is imminent, let's talk briefly about this notion of the cost of inaction. What if we decide to take it easy? What if we say, you, you know, we're not really going to do any significant planning in the utility system. We're simply going to see what happens with the status quo with how customers use their cars and plug them in. And the good news is that there are net benefits even if we do nothing. Uh, this was a, a very robust study. Um, if you have uh, quite a few hours uh, available to read through it, it is excellent. It's called the California Transportation Electrification Assessment. Evaluated um, the costs and benefits of adding electric vehicles to the California grid system uh, across a range of a number of different things. You can see uh, the RPS cost, transmission and distribution, carbon cost, capacity cost, energy costs. Um, even evaluated the uh, capture of federal tax incentives for California customers. And what they found is that even if we didn't change any rate structures, people just plugged in their cars uh, any old way, um, that there would still be uh, significant net benefits, um, that the present value 
of those benefits per vehicle would be on the order of $3,600. It would add up to several billion dollars uh, for the California economy. So that there are still uh, financial and economic benefits, even if we don't do any kind of planning. Um, it, it is true, however, that there could be some specific issues. So this was a, an analysis done by the Rocky Mountain Institute, and they found that the pressure on peak demand of unmanaged electric vehicle charging, which is to say that I drive home from work and I get home at 5 p.m. and I just plug in my car and start charging right away, uh, could be significant uh, and ranging anywhere from 3% to an 11% increase in peak demand when electric vehicles represent about a quarter of the vehicle fleet. So, you know, we're a long way from that. We're talking right now about selling tens of thousands of electric cars in a market that has 200 or 300 million. Uh, but the point is that um, if we don't do anything, even though the overall financial and economic costs will be positive, we will have to do some management of the grid system uh, to manage this peak energy demand. So there are a couple things that can happen if we do nothing. Uh, we do have these six reasons why we're going to see a lot of growth. And the good news is that we have a couple of easy ways that we can take action in order to integrate electric vehicles into our electricity system uh, to see benefits for both customers of the electricity system and electric vehicle owners. And so we'll go back to the polls here uh, for our second question uh, to look at which device can do the most to increase the grid benefits of electric vehicles. So I'm going to go ahead first and just show you your choices here. We have a waffle iron, we have a toaster, and we have a timer. And I will grab the poll here and go ahead and launch that. You can find a poll again on your uh, control panel, the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and go ahead, we'll keep it open for 20 or 30 seconds here. I can't imagine that we're going to have too much trouble uh, in terms of consensus uh, over the right item here. Um, but I appreciate those of you uh, fellow Star Wars fans who are giving a shout out to the waffle maker and the toaster. Um, you may know more than I do. We'll give it just a couple more seconds for folks to participate there. All right. And we'll close the poll with 90% of course picking the right answer. And uh, the, I see that Nick has done some editorial comment in, in creating this poll that sadly it is not a Star Wars light timer, no, but um, it is in fact the tool uh, that we can use. And it's not literally the tool that we're going to use, of course, but the idea is that we can incentivize beneficial charging times, that we can get electric vehicles to charge when uh, it can be most helpful to the grid and avoid it when it's harmful to the grid to integrate them most effectively. So a couple of illustrations of that taken from Minnesota Utilities. Minnesota is one of several states that have adopted laws requiring utilities to offer time of use tariffs for electric vehicle charging. Uh, you can see here then um, Excel Energy, uh, the state's largest utility, has an off-peak rate of about three cents a kilowatt hour and then an on-peak rate anywhere from 15 to about 18 cents per kilowatt hour uh, during daytime hours, basically 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Dakota Electric has a couple of different interesting tariffs. One simply doesn't allow charging during daytime hours at all. Um, only, only has off-peak charging available. The other one with a, a very high time of use rate in that afternoon peak period. Um, and uh, lower prices at, uh, during the off-peak. Uh, and other uh, uh, jurisdictions and utilities, of course, have similar things. Here's from the Sacramento Municipal Utility in California. You can see they have a, a super peak rate for that afternoon period in the summer when they really have that highest demand. Uh, but the rest of the year, they have just a peak and an off-peak period. Uh, and in particular, they have a, a discount for electric vehicle users. So this is a time of use rate that can apply to um, all uses of electricity uh, for a household or a business but the electric vehicles get a particular discount between midnight and 6 a.m. to take advantage of that uh, surplus supply. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So um, getting vehicles on timers, uh, uh, getting vehicles to charge at the beneficial times is probably one of the most successful things that we can do. And as you can see here, 15 states um, had adopted uh, uh, statewide laws requiring the offering of electric vehicle tariffs through June 2015. Uh, New York has a law under consideration um, but I imagine that that will become more popular, whether it's that util utilities will offer them on their own or that states will continue to act uh, to compel utilities to do that. Um, I suspect uh, the former, that utilities are, are simply going to uh, start doing this as, as vehicles become more common. And the, so the second thing, though, the second way that we can act really is, is about deploying infrastructure. So we have kind of three different levels of charging, level one, level two, and sometimes called level three or DC quick charging. Level one is just, you know, a common household outlet, 120 volts. Uh, it can charge at about 1.3 kilowatts. If you're a Nissan Leaf driver like me and you don't drive a whole lot in a day, maybe 15 to 20 miles, you can plug into that guy at 9 p.m. and by 6 a.m. the car is going to be fully charged. 
Uh, the level two charging is uh, going to allow for obviously faster charging, uh, especially important if we actually need to tighten a time period uh, where we need to have that charging done. Uh, and then the DC quick charging is usually, you know, sometimes uh, if you take a brand name, for example, Tesla supercharger network, uh, which has stations along interstate highways to allow for cross country travel, uh, you know, allows filling up a battery at least 80% in 30 minutes or less. And this chart here illustrates kind of the difference in, in why we might want to think about having these level two versus level one charging uh, stations available even in people's homes. So like the Nissan Leaf, for example, if I did take it out and was driving it all day and, and ran it down to near zero capacity on the battery, it would take over 20 hours to fully recharge that battery. So unless I wasn't going to work again the next day, I might not be able to fully recharge. Now maybe that's not a problem because I don't need a full tank, if you will, in order to get to work and home again. Um, but people are, I think generally speaking, going to be interested in having it fully available uh, the next day. And of course, without these higher capacity chargers, we need, might not be able to offer the kinds of grid services or timed charging uh, that's going to be the most efficient way to integrate them into the grid. So you can see here anyway, the level two charging time in blue uh, for these three different model cars, uh, ranging from about five to 15 hours, uh, much, much longer time period if folks are only using a level one charger. Um, and for some of these vehicles, especially for folks who might have a very long commute, maybe a little rural community commuting into the city, uh, uh, or across country, um, the level two charging infrastructure will be very important. And kind of one, one additional uh, factor that I want to throw out there in terms of this deploying of infrastructure as one of the two major ways that we can act uh, is to thinking about what role the utility might play in financing these. Uh, you know, utilities are going to see increased uh, electricity sales, increased revenue from uh, the de deployment of electric vehicles. And it you know, if you just take, for example, uh, 15 electric vehicles and assume that each one of them adds about 4,000 kilowatt hours a year in uh, electricity purchases, that's kind of the, the average that's, uh, that's nosed around, uh, you take that over a 10-year period, well, and, the, and the additional revenue is about $24,000. That would be enough for the utility uh, to, to finance 15 home chargers, level two chargers, for the owners of those vehicles and a public charging station. Um, and if you used a model like this, you could very quickly build out not only the home infrastructure uh, for electric vehicles, which is going to really tie the people who have purchased them into continuing to own electric vehicles, maybe even buy a second one now that they have the infrastructure, but also then uh, put, build out that public infrastructure that would allow for uh, folks to have opportunities, for example, who don't have a, an off-street parking place to own an electric vehicle, among other things. So there's two, two ways that we can act. Um, fairly significantly to uh, take advantage of electric vehicles, uh, to deal with the potential uh, challenges of inaction and to, you know, to respond to those six pressures that, that we see uh, for electric vehicle adoption. I'm going to go through now the six big benefits that we see of taking action, uh, of, of adopting these beneficial charging incentives uh, to, to push people towards either nighttime or you know, daytime overlap with solar for charging uh, and to deploying that, that infrastructure. So one of them is, you know, revisiting this chart from earlier, looking at the potential impact on peak that we can lower by basically an order of magnitude that peak energy impact of electric vehicles uh, if we have controlled charging. If we simply move uh, electric vehicle charging off of that peak period into other times of day, um, most people will take advantage of uh, incentives in order to do that. And so uh, big benefits there for uh, controlling that charging. Um, the second one is around the, these uh, savings of charging off peak. So we've already talked a little bit about the long-term savings of being an electric vehicle owner. We're going to go to the polls again here and look at the average annual savings of charging off peak. So now just to clarify here, off peak in this case refers to in Minnesota, Excel Energy has an off peak energy price about three cents a kilowatt hour for charging. And we're comparing this to the average fuel economy gasoline car on about a 15,000 uh, mile per year basis. And your choices are there in the poll. So we're going to the polls now. Choices are $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000, or a million dollars in average annual savings of being able to charge off peak for your 15,000 miles instead of buying gasoline compared to the average fuel economy vehicle, which is about 22, 25 miles per gallon. We'll give folks a couple more seconds there. Um, or hopefully you're not like me and you're on six other browser tabs during the presentation. Maybe you are, but anyway, find your way back to that control panel. Give you a couple more seconds there. And it looks like 
folks have mostly voted. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you again for participating. And it looks like the wisdom of the crowds is there again. Uh, it's about $1,000, so it's that blue column on the rightmost side there. Um, uh, for using off-peak electricity rates at 10,000 miles, it's about 1,500 uh, for 15,000 miles of annual driving. Uh, and even on standard electricity rates, more around 10 cents a kilowatt hour, still some very significant savings, either at the 10,000 mile per year or 15,000 mile per year driving. So there's a fairly significant benefits uh, that are going to motivate people uh, to um, move to electric vehicles. And, and what's nice is we're talking about, you know, on the first slide there in terms of benefits, uh, system benefits to the whole electricity grid. Now we're also talking about benefits in particular to the drivers of electric vehicles. Uh, we also made a map out of this. You can see here the benefits are higher on the west coast where you often have higher gasoline prices um, uh, on an annual basis. Uh, lower in the southeast where uh, gasoline prices tend to be lower. Um, although you also often have offsetting lower electricity prices as well. Um, but this map is uh, published as part of the report um, and will be available with the slides as well. So we have, you know, the off-peak uh, reduction of peak energy use is one of the benefits of managed charging. We have fuel savings uh, for customers that can be more significant when they have off-peak rates. And we also have grid service opportunities. So not only can uh, vehicles uh, shift uh, and, and avoid those peak energy uh, uh, consumption periods uh, and sh instead shift their demand to off-peak periods, but by simply uh, being available to charge at certain times of day, uh, the electric vehicles can provide what are called ancillary services. So uh, for those not familiar with that term, it means doing things like helping support the consistent voltage on the electricity system. Volt, uh, voltage management being very important in terms of both the operation of electronics and electric motors on the grid, um, and as well as avoiding uh, blackouts or brownouts. Uh, a lot of these services are currently provided by things like natural gas plants that are doing what are called spinning reserves, which is to say everything is operating, we're burning the natural gas, we're spinning the turbine, we're sort of doing everything except plugging in that electricity to the grid system in order to offer uh, this voltage support or um, frequency regulation. Well, electric vehicle batteries, like any kind of battery, can be very effective at offering this service. And by varying the rate of charge, which is what those green arrows represent uh, on the left side, um, that's what can be provided by an electric vehicle that's on a level two charger up to 6.6 .6 kilowatts. Um, there are also opportunities with vehicle to grid. Uh, this is not really commercial yet, but at some point well, we'll hopefully see technology that will allow electric vehicles to also send power out uh, back to the grid system. Uh, but even in the meantime, uh, and there is some more detail on this in the report, uh, there are opportunities to, for vehicle owners to even make money if we can pool them together and bid into regional markets in order to provide these services. So that's the third big potential benefit of uh, providing the right infrastructure uh, for electric vehicles. Uh, another way to look at this is um, looking at whether or not electric vehicles will be available to charge. So the question of course is not just do we have the infrastructure out there but are electric vehicles plugged in at the time when we would need them. So obviously most electric vehicles would be plugged in overnight up to 99 percent of them. Uh, in the nighttime hours, so very good overlap with those off-peak charging rates. Uh, but even during the daytime, we've got about 70% of vehicles idle and parked, um, about 40% at home, and about 30% uh, at, at a workplace. So again, another opportunity if we have public charging infrastructure at workplaces. And one uh, key way that we can look at this is when we consider what in California and other places we call this duck curve. So this is looking at the system demand from the California uh, utility system, the regional grid system for California, that's the dotted gray line. And you can see that demand uh, decreases during the day uh, in the forecasts for uh, 2020 uh, because we have so much distributed and utility scale solar producing electricity that it actually pushes it down the net demand on the system because uh, that's uh, the way that they are viewing that uh, solar energy production is a reduction in demand. But then as, as the sun is setting in the afternoon and people are returning home, turning on air conditioners, demand is spiking up very quickly. Uh, and they're calling that the, the ramp up. And what this illustrates is that if we had tap into those electric vehicles that are parked and available between say 11 a.m. and about 5 p.m., uh, that we would be able to mitigate some of this ramp because we could start absorbing some electricity from that surplus solar that we have available and, and slow down that ramp up in demand in the afternoon. Uh, and this, this in particular looks at uh, for 2025, 
California projects about 1.5 million cars, electric vehicles available in the state. Uh, about uh, the capacity of about half of these would be sufficient to do what is represented by that red dotted line there, and to soak up that excess supply. Um, you know, not all of them are going to be available, so we're not maybe going to be able to do exactly that red line, but there's certainly a significant amount of mitigation that electric vehicles can support uh, for this duck curve, as it's called. So let's, um, let's talk about this another way and look at the overnight charging. So we've already talked about avoiding peak, but looking at the capacity that the utilities have available uh, overnight. Uh, on, and this, for this one, we're going to move to the Midwest grid region, or MISO. Uh, and we'll go back to the polls here. And so we're going to look at how many electric vehicles uh, could charge using the existing overnight capacity in the Midwest grid, grid region. And I apologize, I can't give you a lot of context here for the amount of electricity that's available. So this could be probably more of a wild guess. But we'll go to the polls and look at what folks think. How many thousands or millions of electric vehicles could simultaneously be charging overnight simply using the capacity of power plants that are usually turned on in the sun, on a sunny summer afternoon but not operating uh, during the nighttime hours. And so the polls are open. Please go ahead and find the poll in your control panel. And folks look like they're finding that just fine. Thank you very much. We've got excellent turnout today. That's because we've got same day registration, automatic voter registration here on this uh, webinar. Thank you so much for participating. So I'm going to go ahead and close it there. It looks like we got about 50% of folks think 7.5 million uh, and most folks agreeing that it's somewhere in the millions. Uh, and again, the wisdom of the crowds here. So let's, uh, I, I'm going to break this apart into three different slides to kind of show it here. So initially here you just have two curves. It's the, the July 31st, 2016 and the year before demand curves uh, for the Midwest region. You can see the low overnight demand relative to daytime demand. The second thing I want to throw in is that in the Midwest in particular, that surplus electricity available at nighttime is often supplied by wind power, uh, which is very cheap, of course, that it often bids in at, um, at, at, at very low prices. And so that not only is there a surplus power available, but it has no fuel costs, so it's very cheap. And so the available capacity, about 50,000 megawatt hours, is enough to charge about 7.5 million cars uh, in the Midwest region. And so we have a lot of capacity, and this is again, when, when you go back to that discussion earlier of the, the, the benefits of inaction, we have a lot of available capacity that we can use uh, to charge electric vehicles. And if we can shift them just off those peak hours in the afternoons and get them into the nighttime charging hours, we've got a lot of power plant capacity that's already there, power plants that could run simply more frequently and more efficiently um, and tap into that uh, extra supply. So just a couple more things about benefits really quick um, for tapping into the benefits of electric vehicles. Uh, this one here just focused on transit, um, electric uh, buses in particular, uh, you know, a near total reduction in particulate emissions. Uh, very important given that uh, our electric buses serve a lot of communities that have disproportionately borne the costs of our fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, you get reductions not only in criteria pollutants, but in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And you have net savings. Uh, just uh, this in particular is just in the health benefits, $150,000 in annual savings and the reduction of asthma and other respiratory illnesses. You also have savings, and we talk about these more in the report, from fuel costs and from reduced maintenance uh, from operating electric buses. Uh, we're seeing some very interesting stuff around electric buses because of the Volkswagen settlement money um, that's available to states uh, in terms of uh, opportunities to transition from diesel to electric buses, uh, but also a lot of utility companies getting very interested in uh, facilitating the tr uh, transformation of transit fleets from uh, diesel to electricity. We talked a little bit in a podcast we'll be releasing next week with um, Carl Popham from Austin Energy in Texas uh, about this, their efforts there, uh, the municipal utility working with the transit authority. So another uh, big benefit, not uh, for individual drivers, but for our transit system. And then the last potential benefit here is what we like to call the marriage of the sexy electrics, which is uh, the folks that own EVs but also are interested in rooftop solar. Um, and, and that the, there can be a marriage of these benefits even if it's not the same person that owns the solar and the electric vehicle. And I'll illustrate this uh, right here. So, um, you know, you just take a kind of ordinary neighborhood and let's give a very nice round figure and say that it draws a megawatt. Uh, that might be true if it was only 10 homes, but at, at any rate, let's just say this little neighborhood draws about a megawatt of power during peak periods in the afternoons. 
Uh, and as homes switch over and start installing solar, it will reduce that peak energy demand from the grid system. Now what can happen as solar continues to grow is that it can start backfeeding. We can start getting more solar production uh, than there is electricity demand on that particular circuit of the electricity system. Uh, and that power can start backfeeding. And that can be an engineering challenge for the utility and one that can require some uh, hardware upgrades. Uh, it's also a competitive issue, especially when you have a monopoly utility company where they don't feel like uh, that, that this is where those issue, issues about cost shift or fairness or net metering or what have you or value of solar all start to come up as, well, what, what is the appropriate way to treat that power that is fed back onto the grid? And the nice thing is that with electric vehicles, we have a way to address that issue to some degree, which is that electric vehicles can be charging off of that neighborhood solar uh, production uh, in the afternoons and allowing us to produce more solar in more communities. So this is a possible solution uh, you know, for folks who spend all the time getting really into the weeds and looking at what are called like hosting capacity analyses <coughs> of the utility grid system, looking at that issue of how much solar can we put on the grid. Electric vehicles offer us a potential way that we can add more solar to grid systems if we can find ways to incentivize people to charge uh, when that solar is available. And you're seeing this most often in states like Hawaii or California where you have a lot of solar deployment uh, with electric vehicles. And so instead of seeing like in Minnesota where our, uh, uh, our timed charging or our managed charging rates <coughs> encourage overnight charging to take advantage of surplus electricity production from wind and other sources, uh, that we, can e we might even see discounts for daytime charging uh, from some utility companies where there's been a lot of solar deployment. So in summary, there, we've got six reasons to act here. We've got you know, sales rising quarterly uh, and, and higher at, at, in every quarter in 2016 than they were in the previous years. We've got up to $10,000 in lifetime savings of ownership of electric vehicles. Um, we've got 83% uh, you know, of the daily travel of most Americans uh, is uh, sufficiently covered by today's electric vehicles. We've got a 98 customer satisfaction rating by uh, the, the premium electric car, the Tesla. By 2018, we've got electric vehicles that are going to have much more range. And we've got as much as 30 gigawatts of new power capacity coming onto the system uh, that we need to be prepared to deal with in our utility planning uh, by 2025 or 2030. The good news is we have a couple easy ways to act, deploying that level two infrastructure and giving people an incentive to charge at the right times. And we have lots of benefits of that action, whether it's mitigating the peak demand impacts, providing uh, greater savings to customers for fuel switching from gas to electricity, providing grid services, providing uh, being able to charge many electric vehicles on surplus uh, capacity that's available on our grid system, electrifying transit fleets, and getting more local solar. Uh, the last thing that I want to leave you with in terms of why we need to act now is just looking at this chart of the of technology adoption curves over the past century. And to note, I think the one thing that is the most important to note simply is that when, as you move from left to right, the curves tend to get steeper. Uh, and that the adoption of technology is getting faster and faster uh, over time as, as the technology is changing more and more quickly. And so it's while it might not be true that an electric vehicle is like a smartphone or a tablet where the technology is really improving every year or two and people are have an incentive to buy a new one, I think that we'll see electric vehicle adoption following a similar curve uh, to many of these other ones and to come at an accelerated pace uh, as uh, the mass production of things like batteries really draws, drives down the cost and, uh, and, and people who are able to get more and more information more easily about electric vehicles are incentivized to adopt them. So we're going to go ahead now and take some Q&A. Uh, you can put questions in the questions tab or in the chat tab. Uh, Nick and I will do our best to capture them. Uh, but I thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Again, the recording and the slides will be sent out to everybody. Uh, welcome to stick around. I'll take questions. I've got uh, about another 45 or 50 minutes here set aside, but we don't have to take all that time. Um, and I'm going to go ahead now and take a look at the questions. And I will do my best. Again, feel free to uh, pose more questions as we go here. And I will do my best to get through them. Looks like the first question there was a technical one. And hopefully we didn't have issues with that here. All right, here we go. Um, the first question, sort of more content related, and apologies if folks were having technical issues. We kind of at the mercy of GoToWebinar to manage those. 
uh, was what happened to research in hydrogen fuel and why don't we just see that as a substitute for batteries uh, which can degrade and use up natural resources. Um, you know, I think, oh, I don't go into this in the report, but I think that it's a, a really good question because there was a lot of interest in hydrogen for, and, and there still there still is to some degree. Um, and, and the real issue in my mind is that we simply have, when we're talking about uh, changing over the fuel source for a fleet of vehicles that is all over the place, that is in ho at homes and businesses and, and being used to move people all over the place, that fueling infrastructure has to mimic what we have in place. When you think about gas stations being, you know, every few blocks in an urban area and at all the rest stops on a freeway, um, trying to transition all of that to hydrogen, in my mind, is a massive undertaking. When you can compare that to the fact that the electric, the electric grid reaches almost everywhere we currently have gas stations. In fact, I would posit that it pretty much reaches all of them because pretty much every gas pump uh, is electrically powered. So now what we're talking about is simply upgrading the service to those different places to offer higher voltage charging. Um, so I don't think hydrogen was ever going to be a practical replacement for that. I do think that potentially in uh, air traffic, uh, you know, and um, for airplanes that it could be an interesting source of fuel because it's, uh, you know, high energy density. Um, it, I think it for industrial applications, uh, potentially supplanting natural gas. Um, and I, I do think there's some interesting stuff too with uh, it's been studied both in, I think, in Minnesota and also in Germany, the idea of using um, like overnight wind power to do electrolysis to produce hydrogen fuel. So uh, I don't want to go too much down that road any further, but I want to just say that um, I, it is, it was a, it was a, it's an interesting area of research, and I think they'll serve different purposes. So let's see. Somebody wasn't seeing a graph at one time. I apologize for that. Um, like I said, the slides will be available after, but I'm sure it was uh, frustrating here. Um, question here about sort of rural tourism or, or rural deployment of chargers. How far apart should we plan recharging stations? Um, I, you know, I think if you look at a map, and we have one in the report of Tesla's supercharger network, for example, um, or some of the other uh, fast DC charging networks, uh, I think PlugShare is a website that has a list of them. Uh, that you kind of get the sense of, of what they're trying to do. I, I don't imagine that we're going to have fueling stops too much closer together than maybe, well, I, I guess I don't know. Um, I, I think a lot of the gas stations that are out there on the interstate highway system or on the U.S. highway system are going to start providing electric vehicle charging, um, whether it's at level two or DC fast charging. Um, I'll tell you this much, as a Nissan LEAF driver, I'm not going to drive cross country in a LEAF because even if the I could stop every 10 miles. The fact that I would have to wait 30 minutes to, or 20 minutes or whatever to refuel just doesn't make it practical compared, especially with my kids. I, I don't want to stop any more than I have to. I want to keep going. So I, I think that's going to be the, the metric that we go by is, you know, what is, you know, is the Chevy Bolt with a 240 mile range sufficient that it, people use it as a cross country car? At what point are we going to see electric vehicles be uh, one to one replacements? for uh, existing vehicles or um, and to what degree are the ones that we have like the Nissan LEAF going to be replacements for second cars or for folks who uh, generally don't drive long distances at all. Um, so there's a, like I said, there's a little more on that in the report in terms of that infrastructure, but I think we'll see it mimic the kind of cross-country refueling infrastructure that we have for gasoline vehicles. Um, a question here about battery technologies uh, in terms of extending the range and the cycle life. Um, you know, I, I don't get too much into the technology stuff. We generally focus on the, the overlap of commercially available technology and policy. I do think we still need to have more research into the technologies uh, beyond lithium ion. Uh, but the, on the other hand, what I would also say is that the advantage of lithium, lithium ion is that we use it in everything. We use it in phones and in laptops and in cars. And the, the benefits of mass production in terms of reducing cost are really, really big. So there will hopefully at some point be some kind of breakthrough innovation that will have a battery that can do more of the things that we need and last longer than a lithium ion technology. But for now, I feel like um, we should be very thankful that we're using the same technology in so many places because it really, that mass production benefit is enormous. Um, if you listen to the podcast that we did with Tony Seba, I think we released it just last week. Um, you know, he's really a technology optimist. He talks about, you know, autonomous vehicles also 
uh, really taking over. And he talks about all of the different pieces of technology that um, have gotten so incredibly cheaper as a result of um, mass production, like LiDAR that allows them to, you know, the vehicles to see around them, uh, you know, as a had a hundred or a thousand fold decrease in cost from the first time it was deployed in vehicles. So um, I think that's the key is looking at how do we get from a new technology, which is sort of on the research, you know, the R and D side, and how do we deploy it in a way that allows for mass production? Thank you for the comment on the polls uh, and the questions there. Um, the question here, a good one about uh, impact of time of use rates on low income co income consumers, and is this a barrier for wider adoption? So what I was mostly talking about is electric vehicle tariffs that apply just to vehicle charging. So in Minnesota, for example. The rates that I showed were not time of use rates that apply to everything. They're ones that apply just to vehicle charging. Um, and so, it, it, you know, the, on the flip side of that, Excel Energy, for example, is you know they're looking at a solution to this. But I would have to pay about fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars out of pocket to install a second meter in order to use that uh, tariff for my to charge my electric car. So I don't. I'm on their flat rate program and I happen to charge my car overnight uh, in part because I don't want to overload my house uh, where I have an electric range and central air conditioning and whatnot. But um, so so there's going to be a distinction there. For the utilities that deploy time of use rates for everything, and I do have that choice as an electric vehicle owner to just do everything time of use, I think that is a concern. Um, I, the, the key to good rate design, and I'm going to defer to folks at the Regulatory Assistance Project about this because they're fantastic on it, and I highly recommend reading anything that they've written about time of use rates, is, is that any kind of uh, expense on, that we uh, put on consumers should be avoidable. That if we do time of use rates and we have peak pricing like they have the super peak, for example, in Sacramento, the key is that we also need to give consumers the ability to avoid those charges, and so you know you have whether that's a low-income person who you know is of working age and simply uh, has a low wage, or whether that's someone who's retired and on a fixed income, that is a crucial question. I don't know that I can get into all of the solutions right now. I think that is one reason why I like the idea of charging electric vehicles separately from the electricity use in the rest of the house. That we can eventually talk about good rate design for that, but that there's a very good use case for electric vehicles in particular. Um, the next question actually gets to one last thing I was going to say about this. How does the time frame tariffs, the time of use tariffs, relate to those who provide solar power to the grid? So um, the, this is one of the things I think is going to be very interesting is that the, as the solar deployment increases and I think as we get more sophisticated about it, for example, by having providing incentives for people to install west-facing solar panels to capture more of the late day sun, um, it may be that the peak pricing that we see now that is concentrated in the late afternoon uh, goes away entirely, that the system will have uh, different peaking times or that electricity systems may no longer have significant peaks because we will become much more sophisticated at managing demand. Um, you know, we released a separate report uh, 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 several months ago uh, called Sparking Grid Saving Starts at Home and it looked at kind of commercially available technologies we have and electric loads in homes that we don't currently manage but that are sort of automated like refrigerators and window air conditioning units. And they have devices that can plug into a standard house level outlet and connect to your local Wi-Fi and allow you to turn them on and off. And things like refrigerators and window air conditioning units are ones that, you know, we can, you sort of turn them on and leave them and, you know, with a thermostat setting. So there would be a chance for us to do a lot of additional demand response. So I guess what I would say is long answer to the question. Number one, deployment of solar is going to change where we have peaks and potentially move people to wanting to charge vehicles during the day instead of at night. Uh, the time of use rates that we have there may eventually be used to compensate solar producers, uh, which I think would be great because now you're getting an alignment not only of the people who want to charge and use electricity, like electric vehicle users, and also the people who want to put electricity onto the grid. Um, although I'll say there's a big asterisk there in terms of you know, if I want to invest 20 grand in a solar array, I also want to know how much money I might save from it. So we have to consider that. Uh, but then finally, I think uh, 
you know, we have a lot of different opportunities in the grid of the 21st century to manage energy demand. Electric vehicles represent one big source of that, uh, but we're going to have lots of other th ways to do this. Um, and we're seeing uh, regulators starting to take more interest in that. In Minnesota, for example, they just told Excel Energy that they had to find the 400 megawatts of new demand response uh, in their most recent resource plan, which is probably an order of magnitude too small, frankly, for what's probably out there, but it's going in the right direction. Um, let's see, a couple other ones here. This one's about the example about 15 electric vehicles and how the utilities revenue could finance infrastructure deployment. Um, and then a question about how ChargePoint and other uh, private providers of charging infrastructure would think of that approach. So I, I had someone from ChargePoint read this report and I talked to them about it for that exact reason. And the question is, um, you can, is how you can have competition among charging technology companies if the utility is financing the chargers. So I think what you need to have, what they described it as kind of like an, an open and rolling RFP, which is to say that when you put out the RFP, you have an ability to incorporate new charger technologies as they become available so that you're not missing out on an opportunity to capture new charging things. Uh, but that you also have stipulations to use multiple charging tech, uh, charger technologies so that you are, you know, multiple vendors. Uh, you know, we're at a time right now with the deployment where we really need to try a lot of different things and see how they work in the real world. So whether that's uh, um, Clipper Creek or Juicebox or ChargePoint, there are so many different companies out there now innovating and coming up with clever ways, excuse me, uh, to do different things with their chargers. So like I bought one for my uh, electric vehicle, a, a level two charger for my garage, and uh, it has the ability to turn up and down uh, the capacity, the amperage, uh, to vary the charge rate, which is important to me because I have a 100 amp panel at home, and if I allowed that thing to run at 50 amps like it can, it would potentially uh, brown out my entire house. It would trip my uh, main breaker to my entire house. It also has a, an app that it can connect to the phone um, and that allows me to manage the charging of my vehicle. So. Um, I think it's really important, we talk about this a little bit in the report, that uh, no matter how we have utilities do that financing, that it is still competitive among those technologies so that we can learn from all the different things that are out there. Um, ooh, good question about car batteries being recycled. Um, yes, there is going to be both recycling by the manufacturers of those batteries, potentially into new batteries. There's also going to be reuse cases. Um, I would definitely recommend looking at uh, Green Tech Media or Utility Dive. They've got some great stories recently about um, car batteries being repurposed uh, in terms of being used for stationary storage for the electric grid. Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of ways we can take a battery that maybe is no longer suitable for someone in a vehicle because it uh, depletes too quickly or its overall capacity has decreased. Uh, but that short of recycling could be reused for a lot of other potential applications, whether it's like a home backup storage battery, uh, or actually there was a guy, uh, there was a video I saw going around yesterday on Twitter of a fellow who took um, old uh, electric vehicle batteries that had been depleted beyond what, I think they were in leased vehicles, and so they were beyond the level that the, um, that the manufacturer was willing to use them, and he put them together in the frame of like a 20-year-old BMW or something and has a car that has more range than any other electric vehicle on the market using repurposed older batteries. So uh, certainly it's a special use case. You're not going to see everybody going out and building their own electric car like this guy did. But what he does is he highlights the fact that we have a lot of different ways that we can reuse those batteries. Um, question here about the role for the DC microgrid. So. Um, for folks that aren't familiar, there is a lot of really good research in this notion about how do we um, take like office buildings or homes or a collection of those, and instead of uh, uh, changing over the electric, so well, let me back up a second. There's two kinds of electricity in our system. There's direct current, which is what comes off of a solar panel, and then there's alternating current, which is generally what comes off of the turbines that produce power in our traditional power plants, and uh, alternating current can be sent further with fewer losses, which is why we ultimately ended up adopting it as our grid standard in the U.S. and most other countries. But direct current is much more efficient over short range. 
And if we're going to be producing much more of our electricity from sources like solar that are direct current, we will lose less of it if we don't transfer it over into alternating current. So the question would be, in a home that has solar and batteries and an electric vehicle, none of which need alternating current in order to operate, because an electric motor uses direct current, um, can we have a lot of energy savings by operating all of it on direct current? And so um, I guess what I would say is the DC microgrid notion right now is one that we are seeing on kind of like the edge of commercial reality. And so it's not one that we followed a whole lot, but it's a technology that's worth keeping an eye on. As we see microgrid deployment in general happening, I think we are going to see more deployment of campus systems or commercial buildings that are DC only. And the way that they might interface with electric vehicles is very interesting. Um, I think it's going to take a while before we see a lot of that percolate throughout all of the electric vehicles, simply because right now, in order to buy an electric vehicle, I have to feel comfortable. I can charge it everywhere. So the hardware that they're giving me when I buy my car, like my Leaf, was something I can plug into a standard household outlet that operates on alternating current. So um, there's a lot of things I think that have to change, but I think that we're probably going to move in that direction in the long run in a lot of uh, cases. Um, Oh, good question. Will the presentation sound and slides be made online? Yes, we will post it as a video probably later this week, early next week, um, but also uh, the slides will be up separately as well for download. Um, great question here about a townhouse. So no garage, no dedicated parking spot. This is definitely a use case that we explored in the report, um, but having shared parking out front would it be okay from an electric code perspective to have a wall-mounted charging station, a cable running across uh, the walkway. Um, I am not an electrician, or no, do I have code experience. I can say that I did wire my own charger, but that's for my own property, and I have a garage. So I can tell you from a code perspective, I can have my the enclosed cable that runs from the charger to the thing I plug into the car. That can be running on the ground, and that's fine. Sort of like it's okay to have an extension cord in your house running somewhere probably more of a question for your property manager than it is for the electric code about having the, ch the cable from your charger to the, where the car would be running across right-of-way. So I don't think I have an exact answer to that question. I think what we are going to need to see more often is how can we easily deploy charging infrastructure for people who do not have um, off-street parking? Uh, that, I, think, I think that's a really important, crucial question here. One way to deal with that, you can hear it in the podcast with um, the fellow from Austin Energy on Monday is they've deployed a bunch of public charging stations and you can just subscribe to unlimited access to those stations for about four dollars a month. So very low cost, unlimited access. Uh, now you can maybe just find a way on a weekend that you could charge your vehicle uh, or a couple evenings a week or something. Maybe you go out to dinner uh, and you're near one of those chargers they're going to need a lot more of them. There's no question about it. But I think that's one thing. Also saw, after we published the report, a really interesting idea of offering 120-volt ports, so just level one charging, on lamp posts. So you know, the electricity is already there on all these light posts that we have in our communities. Why not just put a couple plugs at the bottom, and people could plug in there. They could trickle charge, which might not be enough for long-distance travel, but that would cover most of the daily use for most people, especially in urban areas, which is what you're talking about when you've got a lot of light posts and off-street uh, and the need for on-street parking. So I think there's an interesting opportunity there for cities to partner with utilities to figure out how they can deploy that and, and how they can figure out how to meter those in order to uh, you know, have that electricity paid for. But there's, I think, a really big opportunity there uh, in terms of thinking about that. Looks like we've just got a couple more questions. You're still welcome to ask questions in, in the uh, Q&A there uh, or in the question tab on the GoToWebinar. Also happy to follow up by email for folks who have um, specific questions. Um, question here, uh, uh, back on the DC thing really quick. Do you see DC chargers sourced from on-site PV in the home? Um, I definitely do see that as being one of the better uh, options for direct current stuff. You know, We did a report on microgrids about uh, 18 months ago, and one of the things that I see is challenging for microgrids is when the microgrid is going to encompass more than one electric customer. So I think the case, the case, the use case we're going to see most frequently is when it's a single hospital or a single university or a single 
individual who wants to have their own microgrid. And at that point, it becomes, it starts to make sense for them considering the way that they use energy to say, okay, yeah, with my solar panel, I'm going to have it plug into the meter so that I can operate with the alternating current and have an inverter. But maybe I have another way, another offtake from my solar panel that's direct current only that I can use for charging my electric vehicle. Um, and, and so, uh, or, or to charge other direct current devices without using the power brick, for example. I think we'll see more of that in the future. Um, but it, you know, a lot of different, a lot of, it has it's sort of the chicken and the egg problem where, you know, will my laptop come with a port where I can charge from DC? Maybe not until there's enough uh, folks who have available charging infrastructure for that. So it's, um, it's similar to the vehicle to grid stuff that we talk about in the report. We actually ended up putting in the appendix because uh, the problem is that not a lot of car manufacturers want to put in vehicle to grid stuff if utilities don't have standards and plans to use it and vice versa utilities are reluctant to spend a lot of time planning how to do vehicle to grid uh, if the cars don't come equipped to do it. Um, looks like the last one here might be a comment someone who's got their first electric vehicle they've got a Chevy Bolt uh, charging with the electricity uh, extra, extra electricity from their net zero house um, but also glad uh, to be connected to the grid because of the high charging demand so I think that is I mean I'm going to pivot a bit on this question and just say I think there's always going to be a really great argument for staying grid connected. That solar and EVs and storage I think are important as political pressures on the utilities and regulators to think about how they make sure that the grid is still a valuable resource, that there's a value in staying connected. But I think there always is going to be that, you know, whether it's the fact that maybe my solar array might not work, uh, that it's cloudy for several days in a row, although you know, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Solar panels still produce on cloudy days, just not as much. Um, whether it's that my electric vehicle, I want to charge it at a high rate uh, at a, you know, because I'm going out of town, I need that battery completely filled in a, in a short amount of time. Um, it always makes more sense to have a network. You know, it's why the internet works is because it's a network that everybody can access. And so I think that's, to me, that gets into the bigger issues um, of the design of the electricity system. We write about that all the time in a number of our different reports around this notion of giving kind of common carrier access to everybody to the grid system uh, so that, you know, maybe when you need more energy from the grid, it's because you're buying it from your neighbor's solar panels rather than having to buy it from the incumbent and monopoly utility companies. So uh, a lot of different things to think about with the grid there, but uh, very pleased to hear from a fellow EV owner. Um, I've enjoyed it a lot myself just in my first month, uh, and not the least of which is I get to wonk out on all, how all of this stuff works personally as well as professionally. Um, that's all the questions we have, so I just want to thank you all again for attending uh, and listening. Again, if you need to follow up with questions, please do. We'll be putting up the video and the slides of the presentation in the next week. Uh, hope that they're useful for you in your reference and in your work, but also would encourage you to help us share them around uh, as widely as possible. Thanks again.